Hello, welcome back to Western Civilization 101 and our lecture series. We, of course, learned about the Holy Roman Empire in our previous lecture, and today we turn our attention to England and the Anglo-Saxons and the Norman conquest that resulted around 1066. Uh, remember the, the Anglo-Saxons were a Germanic tribe that had uh, settled in England and uh, had dominated in the Middle Ages. There was an instance where a Viking by the name of Canute will take over in England. But we basically will see an Anglo-Saxon assembly in England at this time. Now, uh, there was an Anglo-Saxon king that, of course, you'll learn more about this in this upcoming lecture, but briefly, there was an Anglo-Saxon king by the name of Edward the Confessor, uh, and he ruled in the early 12th, uh, 11th century, early 11th century. He died with no children. He was childless. And we see, of course, that um, there will be a few people that claim the throne in England um, that have some relation to Edward, Edward the Confessor, and say that they are the next rightful king of England. And one of those people is a man by the name of William of Normandy, or William the Conqueror, as he's called. Now, Normandy is located in the north of France, and Normandy had at one time been given to the Vikings um, by the French, and so it's a, a little separate, and William is known as the Duke of Normandy, but he is also a cousin to Edward the Confessor. Now, Edward was very weak, so it seems, and he acknowledged William as his heir, but the Anglo-Saxon assembly um, said no. They vetoed Edward's last wish, and they chose someone else, a man named Harold Godwinson. And he took over. But William was not simply going to let it go. He still, still, vehemently says that he is the rightful king of England, that the throne is his. So William will invade. He will get his army together. He will cross the English Channel. Normandy is right across the English Channel. And he will invade, and there will be a battle, a very famous battle that takes place at Hastings, the Battle of Hastings in 1066. And it is there, of course, that William will defeat his enemies and he will make himself and be declared King of England, which will start a whole new chapter in English history. Um, now, of course, you know, his son will, will take over and there will be a dynasty here with William the Conqueror or William the Duke of Normandy. And so it will definitely change English history um, we'll start to see that uh, common law eventually that is very important to the United States will develop here. Parliament, um, that representative uh, body, uh, kind of like our Congress, not exactly of course, but the English Parliament will eventually develop um, after this Norman conquest. We'll uh, start to see the, the Magna Carta is signed by another king by the name of John, which will be very important for the United States and our history that it recognized the, the feudal rights of the, of the king's subjects and it, it kind of binds the king to a law and says that the king pretty much isn't absolute. It kind of lays the foundation for what's known as a constitutional monarchy, which we will see eventually develop in England. Um, not right away, of course, but eventually. Not everyone followed the Magna Carta, but it's still there and it will still be a very important document, not only to English history, but to the United States, uh, the development uh, of the United States as well. So let's uh, learn more about the Anglo-Saxons in England and of course the Norman conquests. When the Roman government began to fall apart in the 5th century AD, one of the first provinces from which the Roman government withdrew its legions was Britain. 
This occurred in 410 AD. By about the middle of the century, around 450, Britain began to experience invasions from several Germanic tribes on the continent. Prominent among these were the Angles, the Saxons, and to a lesser extent, the Jutes. These tribes shared with other continental Germanic tribes a number of characteristics. They tended to be tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. As a general rule, they were illiterate and had little art at the time. They tended to live in timber huts. Uh, their agriculture was left to women, while the men largely in involved themselves in hunting and fighting. Uh, there was a barter economy. The main sign of wealth at the time was how much cattle you owned, and in fact, land was held in common. The main social organization of these Germanic people was the tribe, and the tribe was initially led by a chieftain who would later evolve into a king once these tribes settled down in Britain. Within the tribe, another important institution was the comitatus. This was the war band. Uh, made up of all the young men of war uh, fighting age, and it was held together by a strong sense of loyalty, loyalty both to the chieftain and to one another. It was felt to be a complete disgrace to leave the battlefield alive if your chieftain had died, unless, of course, you had utterly defeated the other side. So Anglo -Sax Angles, Saxons, and Jewish uh, tribesmen fought with great ferocity. Still another important group, uh, which was something they had in common with other Germanic tribes, was the kinship group. That is, not only your own family, but your extended family, your blood relations as far out as you could find them. And this, too, gave a kind of collective identity to uh, members of the various Germanic tribes. Uh, any honor that came to your kinship group uh, affected all, any disgrace affected all, and any injury affected all. So in fact, as with Germanic tribes generally, uh, a common problem uh, among Germanic uh, tribesmen that ended up in Britain was the blood feud. That is a situation in which a member of one kinship group injures or kills a member of another kinship group you have retaliation and it escalates into a full-blown feud. The way that uh, the Germanic tribes got around this very destructive behavior was through the introduction, introduction of the Wergeld. That is a means whereby one kinship group could seek payment, damages in other words, from the other group rather than to exact revenge in blood. Uh, also they brought with them to Britain uh, the practice of oath-taking uh, and of the ordeal. That is, when someone was accused of, taking, of committing a crime, uh, he would swear an oath before the old Germanic gods uh, to his innocence. He might also get witnesses to come and take oaths with him, uh, swearing to his good character and so on. But in the event that there was not a, a sufficient verdict one way or the other, then the accused would go through an ordeal, uh, ordeal by fire, ordeal by water, or occasionally ordeal by combat. So all of these characteristics come to Britain with the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. Now among the tribes that remained on the continent, the one to which the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes bore the most similarity were the Franks. They were an agrarian people. They tended to migrate slowly, they tended to put down very deep roots, and they were hard to displace once they had settled somewhere. At the time of their arrival in Britain, uh, they had been little influenced by the Roman. They remained pagan, that is to say non-Christian, and um, were still in a fairly uncivilized state. Much of the early history of the Anglo-Saxon invasions between about 450 and about 600 is uh, largely shrouded in myth. And perhaps no myth is greater than that of the supposed great Celtic defender against the Saxons, King Arthur. Uh, no Arthur is actually known to have existed. Uh, Arthur may in fact be based upon some other character. He may be a composite or he may be a complete myth. But almost all of the stories that we associate with Arthur uh, originate much later on in the Middle Ages, not from the period that we're talking about now. Where we get on fairly firm footing with what we know about the Anglo-Saxon period comes around 600 BC. Uh, by that time, 
the tribes that had settled in Britain had begun settling down into kingdoms and by about 650 AD they had settled down into seven, into what was known as the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy. Most of the kingdoms in the Heptarchy, which means seven kingdoms, took their names from some geographical feature uh, around them. Thus the West Saxons became the people of Wessex, the South Saxons of Sussex, the East Saxons of Essex. The Angles who lived in the eastern part of England were in East Anglia. The people north of the Umber River were known as uh, Northumberland. And a little bit less uh, clearly linked uh, to location, uh, in Kent there was a significant number of Jutes and in the Midland region of England, surrounded by these other kingdoms, was the Kingdom of Mercia. Many of the Celtic people who had occupied Britain prior uh, to the Roman invasion and who had continued to coexist with the Romans fled into what came to be known as the Celtic Fringe. Cornwall in the southwest, Wales in the west, Scotland in the north, and Ireland across the Irish Sea. The first ruler about whom we know very much uh, is an individual by the name of Ethelbert of Kent. And one of the things that distinguishes Ethelbert of Kent is he is recognized by contemporary historians of the time as what is called a Bretwalda. That is uh, an individual who was an overlord over other kingdoms. One of the steps towards the eventual unification of the seven kingdoms into one kingdom of England was that individuals within a particular kingdom might exercise sovereignty over other kingdoms as well, and Ethelbert is our first well-documented example of that. Ethelbert ruled in the southeast in the kingdom of Kent, and besides being Bretwalda, he also has another important distinction, and that has to do with the introduction of Christianity into Britain. Of course, Christianity had been in Britain before under the Romans, but when the Romans pulled out, much of the kingdom uh, that fell under the control of Angles, Saxons, and Jutes reverted to paganism. However, Ethelbert of Kent had married a woman named Bertha, who was the daughter of a Frankish king named Cheribert. And Bertha was a baptized Christian who began to persuade Ethelbert that he should support Christianity. Uh, as we'll see in a little bit more detail later on, during his reign, St. Augustine of Canterbury, not to be confused with the earlier St. Augustine of Hippo, arrived in Kent, and thanks to Ethelbert's wife, he got a warm welcome and was assisted by Ethelbert in establishing Christianity in southeastern England. Ethelbert also is one of the Bretwaldas whom we know to have propounded his own law code, uh, which would be imitated by other Bretwaldas later on. After Ethelbert's death, overlordship in England shifted from Kent to the northern kingdom of Northumbria, uh, where there was a king by the name of Edwin who united two smaller kingdoms of Bernicia and Dara into what we know as the kingdom of Northumbria. He also was converted to Christianity around 627 uh, by a bishop by the name of Paulinus and began extending his kingdom south of the Umber River and into Wales, spreading Christianity uh, along with his political power as he went. Uh, however, he was killed in battle in 632 uh, by two, in, a, in a battle with two enemies, Penda of Mercia, a pagan king, and Cadwallon of Gwynedd in northern Wales. He was succeeded eventually by Oswald of Northumbria, another Northumbrian Bretwalda, uh, who eventually killed Cadwallon in battle, restored the power of Northumbria, began extending its power into southern Scotland, but was himself also killed in battle by Penda of Mercia, the pagan king, in 641. The third Northumbrian Bretwalda was a man by the name of Oswy, who um, eventually ousted all of his rivals for the throne in Northumbria, and ultimately in 655 defeated and killed Penda of Mercia in battle. Uh, Oswy was the last 
northern Brett Walda before that power shifted elsewhere, but he also defeated the last major pagan king in Britain in the person of Penda. Next, power shifted to the Middle Kingdom of Mercia in the 8th century, where there were two very powerful Anglo-Saxon kings. The first of these was Ethelbald of Mercia, who reigned from 716 to 757. Uh, although he was a great nephew of Penda, he had converted to Christianity and, in fact, was so powerful and so effective in extending his Bretwaldaship over the rest of Britain that he was sometimes referred to as the King of Britain. But that is nothing to the accomplishments of his successor, uh, Offa of Mercia, who reigned from 756, I'm sorry, 757 until 796. Offa is often described as Rex Anglorum, that is, King of England. Uh, he ruled over not only Mercia, but he also uh, annexed to his kingdom East Anglia, Kent, and Sussex, and forced the rest of the kingdoms to acknowledge him as overlord. He carried out one of the most spectacular building projects of the Anglo-Saxon period, building a giant levee to separate Mercia from Wales, known as Offa's Dyke. He also was contemporary with and corresponded with Charlemagne, uh, the great continental ruler who treated Offa more or less as an equal, although obviously Charlemagne was a far more powerful ruler. He corresponded with the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, the Islamic Caliphate in Spain, and uh, also was on extremely good relationship, or, or, or had extremely good relationships with the popes of his day. In fact, had Offa been more successful with his heirs, it is likely that we would attribute to him much of what we attribute to the later king, Alfred the Great. During his reign, uh, England for a brief time actually had a third archbishopric located in the kingdom of Mercia, the archbishopric of Lichfield. Uh, Offa minted his own coins. Uh, he also was very successful at war and uh, was quite a major figure in leading toward the unification of um, England. Before we turn to Mercia's successors as Brett Walda in the 9th century, we need to stop for a minute and look at the development of Anglo-Saxon Christianity because it presents some unusual features or problems if you wish to look at them that way. Anglo-Saxon Christianity actually had two different sources. With the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, many Celtic Christians had continued to survive in Ireland, and in fact there was a flourishing Christianity in Ireland that remained largely separate from continental Christianity and largely cut off from the head of the continental church in Rome. And then of course Roman Christianity persisted even after the Roman Empire ceased to do so. So in fact Christianity would be introduced into England from two different directions, from the north by Irish missionaries, and from the south by Roman missionaries, that is, missionaries sent by the Pope in Rome. Looking first at the Irish, uh, one of the first Irish missionaries to come to England was a man named St. Columba, uh, who arrived uh, off the coast of Britain uh, on the island of Iona around 563, founded a monastery there and began evangelizing first the Scots and then later on the English in the northern part of England. Now, what would motivate the Irish to do this? Well, Irish Christianity was largely centered around monasteries, whereas the continent by this time had a system of bishops and archbishops and at the local level parishes. The Irish did not have that. Worship was organized almost entirely around monastic communities. Monks in the monastery served as priests to the lay people and so on. And one of the things that Irish monastics put a great deal of emphasis on upon in this period was asceticism, that is the practice of self-denial. And one way that they could do that was by going into exile. 
uh, this, this was considered to be a great sacrifice, and St. Columba undertook that sacrifice both to spread the gospel and also as, as a means of practicing self-denial himself. Uh, a later uh, Irish missionary, often easily confused with St. Columba, was Columbanus, who was actually a missionary to Europe and founded a number of monasteries on the continent there. Um, but there were other Irish missionaries who would follow in their footsteps into England, and as a result, they began the conversion of the northern English kingdoms to the Irish version of Christianity. Meanwhile, in Rome, the last of the great church fathers, uh, Pope Gregory I or Pope Gregory the Great, uh, a man renowned for his theology and also for his authorship of the Gregorian chants, became involved in the process of evangelizing the Anglo-Saxons as well. Uh, there is a story that supposedly he saw a young uh, Anglo-Saxon boy uh, with blonde hair and fair features in Rome and wanted to know where this child was from. And upon being told he was an Angle but a pagan, uh, Gregory, according to the story, is supposed to have said, well, we must convert these angles into angels. Cute story, may or may not be true, but what certainly is true is that in 595, Gregory chose St. Augustine, later to be known as Augustine of Canterbury, a Benedictine monk, to go to England and to spread the gospel. And it is this St. Augustine who ends up in the kingdom of Ethelbert of Kent in 597. There, Ethelbert uh, assisted him uh, in establishing the church. Ethelbert became the first Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, after a time began appointing other bishops as well, and achieved a fair amount of success in establishing Christianity there. Now, as part of the Gregorian mission, that is the mission sent by Gregory the Great, Paulinus, uh, uh, also known as Paulinus of York, eventually made his way to Northumbria where he converted uh, Edwin of Northumbria. Meanwhile, uh, an Irish monk by the name of Aidan of Lindisfarne also was spreading Christianity in Northumbria uh, where he helped to influence Oswald and Oswy and some of their contemporaries. Now at this point, a problem emerged because, of course, eventually the Irish-influenced uh, Christians began bumping into the uh, Roman-influenced Christians and some very uh, problematic differences emerged among the two. Now, some of these differences might seem trivial to you now. They were not considered trivial at the time. Others will obviously uh, look important. One of the differences, which, which perhaps will not look such, like such a big deal now, had to do with how uh, monks uh, shaved their heads to achieve what's called the tonsure. Uh, on the continent, they shaved a portion of the middle of their heads, creating uh, an appearance of baldness there, whereas the Irish shaved from the front back. Uh, again, doesn't seem like a big deal to us, but it was to them. However, the other two issues over which they disagreed were obviously much more important. One had to do with when to celebrate the, the Feast of Easter. The Irish used one formulation of the calendar, the Romans used the other, and this became a very bitterly fought out issue. Perhaps most important was the question of, not, of whether or not the Irish Christians would recognize the authority of the Pope in Rome and adopt the system of bishops and archbishops and what have you. This became a very contentious issue and was a particular concern to King Oswy of Northumbria, who in 664 summoned a meeting known as the Synod of Whitby in which he heard both sides present their issues and ultimately wound up coming down on the side of the Roman Christians. Uh, agreeing to approve their tonsure, their celebration of East, Easter, and their uh, system of authority. Uh, this was not immediately embraced by all the Irish, but within a fairly short time it was, and therefore uh, 
uh, English Christianity really became unified before England was politically unified. It continued to develop over time. Uh, uh, a later 7th century Archbishop of Canterbury by the name of Theodore of Tarsus, who as the name indicates was Greek, uh, came to England uh, where he established uh, a number of schools which promoted education, particularly for priests. Uh, he was joined uh, by a man named Benedict Biscop, who established a couple of important monasteries at Jarrow and Monk Wearmouth, basically next door to each other. Uh, these are particularly important because they became the home to a huge library of religious books and therefore a great source of education for the priesthood. Uh, by the 8th century, the church, the Anglo-Saxon church had become so vibrant that it actually began producing missionaries who went to the continent into the northern part of Europe and helped to convert pagans there to Christianity. The most famous example uh, being St. Boniface, uh, who traveled widely in northern Europe in the early 8th century and actually had considerable contact with Charlemagne's grandfather, Charles Martel, and his father, Pepin the Short. Uh, helped to establish monasteries, helped to set up a system of parishes, uh, helped to bring Christianity down to the local level in many cases uh, before becoming a martyr uh, at the hands of some Frisian pagans in 754. Meanwhile, back in Britain at uh, the monastery of Jero, there was a monk by the name of Bede, now referred to often as the Venerable Bede, who recorded much of the early history of the Anglo-Saxons in his Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which is still an immensely valuable resource for historians studying the period. Now all seemed to be going well. The church was flourishing. Offa of Mercia had created a greater degree of unity than it existed before, although England was not unified per se. And in the early uh, 9th century, the Bretwalda ship shifted to the southwestern kingdom of Wessex. By that time, however, something new had emerged on the horizon, and that something was the Vikings. Uh, the Vikings staged their first well-known raid uh, on the British territory in 793 when they raided the monastery on Lindisfarne, and that opened up Britain to a couple of centuries of Viking raids over uh, the next couple of hundred years. Um, the Vikings who came to Britain primarily uh, were Norwegians and Danes. Those in what is now England were primarily Danes, uh, driven to Britain by the same forces that drove them into continental Europe, uh, population pressure uh, and the need for more food coupled with the fact that they now had the technological advantage provided to them by Viking longships, which were very seaworthy and uh, very easy to use for raiding sorts of activity. Now, of course, it fell to the kings of Wessex, now Bretwaldas in the 9th century, to resist this Viking incursion. And before I tell you about them, I want to mention something because we'll, we'll be getting into some names that are used for monarchs both before the Norman Conquest in 1066 and after the Norman Conquest. But one of the things to note is that numbers that are assigned to the Anglo-Saxon kings are not continuous with those that come after. The system of numbering starts over in 1066. So for example, there's several Edwards in the Anglo-Saxon period, but then in 1272 we get an Edward I, who is the first Edward post-conquest. Well, in Wessex, there was a Bretwalda beginning in 802 and ruling down to 839 named Egbert, uh, who really established Wessex as the dominant kingdom in England. However, Egbert also faced the brunt of intensive Viking invasions and as a consequence, 
had no small amount of trouble during his reign in holding his kingdom together. He eventually passed the kingdom on to his son Ethelwolf, who ruled from 839 to 856 and likewise had difficulties with the Vikings. Ethelwolf had four sons, and as it turned out, the, the crown would pass to all four of them, a, a highly improbable development, but one that turned out to be very propitious for Wessex in the long run. Uh, after briefly passing to, to sons named Ethelbald, Ethelbert, and Ethelred, the, th the crown came in 871 to the youngest of the four brothers, whose name was Alfred, and who history now knows as Alfred the Great, the only Anglo-Saxon king given that nickname. He obviously had not expected to be king, and indeed he might not have been at the time anyway, as he had some living nephews who technically took precedence over him in the succession, but were minors at the time. And facing a Viking invasion, uh, clearly Wessex needed uh, an adult king. Uh, by the time that Alfred took over, the Vikings had overrun most of England. The only parts that were hold, still holding out against Viking invasion were in fact part of Mercia and most of Wessex. Alfred's initial response was not particularly heroic, although it was absolutely necessary. When he came to the throne, he essentially paid the Vikings tribute to go away, and that worked in the short run. But in 875, the Vikings came back, uh, led by a particularly capable leader by the name of Guthrum. Once again, Alfred bought them off. But in 878, they came back for a third time, and this time, Alfred was forced to retreat uh, into the swamps of Somerset, uh, where he gradually regrouped and formulated a plan for defeating the Vikings. Uh, later in that year, he won a great victory over Guthrum's host at Eddington, and thereafter, he was able to force the Vikings to withdraw to the northeastern half of England, or what came to be known at the time as the Dane Law. The Dane Law basically included uh, East Anglia, North Umbria, and Eastern Mercia. Part of the deal here is that Alfred and Guthrum made peace. Guthrum agreed not to molest Alfred further. Uh, Alfred agreed to allow Guthrum the peaceful governance of the Dane law. But there was also another condition, and that is that Guthrum had to agree to be baptized as a Christian and to promote Christianity among his followers. Now, at this point, there ensued a fairly lengthy peace, a period of peace for Alfred the Great and the West Saxons, and Alfred proceeded to use this both to strengthen his government and also to make preparations for future conquest of the Dane law. One of the things that he did was to establish what are known as boroughs. Uh, boroughs are essentially fortresses. Uh, Alfred built fortresses all along the border between, West, or between Wessex and the Danelaw. These, of course, are not the stone fortresses we're familiar with from later on. They're basically uh, earthworks surmounted by a wooden tower and a palisade. Nevertheless, they would prove to be effective. And in fact, he kept close tabs on the building and maintenance of these fortresses uh, with a document known as the Burgal Hydage. He also converted the Anglo-Saxon militia, which is known as the Feared, into a standing army in which at any given time, half the men available were in service and half were at home tending their crops. Recognizing that the Vikings' great military advantage came from their longships, he began constructing longships himself in order to be able to fight the Vikings at sea. Uh, this has led to Alfred being called, uh, in, in something of an exaggeration, the father of the English Navy. Nonetheless, 
uh, it is important that he constructed these because it meant that he was prepared to fight the Vikings both on land and at sea if necessary. And by 886, uh, Alfred was widely recognized as king of all the Anglo-Saxons outside of the Dane law. He also helped to promote a greater sense of national identity and a greater degree of learning in his kingdom. Alfred imitated Charlemagne by assembling a, te by assembling a team of scholars uh, at his court in Winchester. Uh, and among other things, these scholars helped to translate a number of important works into Old English and also uh, to begin putting together the history of the Anglo-Saxon people. One of the things that Alfred recognized is that two of the things that give a nation a sense of identity are its history and its language. Therefore, he wanted uh, the Anglo-Saxon people of Wessex to be able to hear religious works and other works read in their own language, and he wanted them to have a sense of their history. So, for example, he became the sponsor of what we know as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, uh, a year-by-year -year history of the Anglo-Saxons going back to earliest times, uh, another work that remains immensely valuable to Anglo-Saxon historians. He also supervised and participated in the translation of a number of works, including Bede's Ecclesiastical History, which also helped to foster a sense of national identity. Uh, he helped to translate the Psalms, uh, the Soliloquies of St. Augustine, and the Consolation of Philosophy of Boethius, as well as the Pastoral Care of Gregory the Great. All these translated from Latin into Old English. Uh, in addition to language and history, he also encouraged the production of native literature in the Old English language, and he promulgated a law code uh, based on earlier law codes but more wide-ranging than others, and he issued his own coinage, all of which helped to unite uh, the people of West Sa West, the, the West Saxons more effectively. Like any great leader, uh, Alfred is the subject of uh, a good deal of mythology. In fact, in that he's very much like George Washington. Uh, there's all sorts of stories told about him that, that, that are essentially myth. Uh, none of this takes away from his greatness any more than those uh, about Washington take away from his. But one of the myths told about him has to do with Alfred supposedly uh, seeking shelter in a peasant hut while he was on the run from the Vikings, being left in charge of the baking by a peasant woman and absentmindedly burning the bread that she was making and being scolded by the peasant. Uh, this is a, a story that every little British school kid learns, uh, just like most American kids used to hear the one about George Washington and the cherry tree. Um, in 892, the Vikings return, not, not Guthrum's Vikings, but a new batch from the continent. Alfred was now well prepared, was assisted by his adult son, Edward, uh, also sometimes known as Edward the Elder, and was able to drive the Vikings away and live the last few years of his life in peace. Although Alfred didn't actually unite England, he laid the groundwork for it, and the job was finished by his son, Edward the Elder, and his grandson, Athelstan the Glorious. Uh, Edward the Elder won a number of victories over uh, the Vikings during his reign from 899 to 924, and even compelled the kings of Wales and southern Scotland to recognize him as their overlord. Athelstan the Glorious, who ruled from 924 to 939, uh, finished the job, drove the Vikings out of the Dane law, and ruled over all of what is now considered to be England. Now, over the next few reigns, there was some waxing and waning of Anglo-Saxon power, the Vikings periodically would come back and take territory, and the Anglo-Saxons would then drive them out again. The next king I want to mention uh, is Edgar the Peaceable, uh, 
who ruled from 959 to 975. And there are a couple of things that are significant here. One, the nickname tells you right off that he's at peace part of the time because of the success of his predecessors. Another thing that is significant about him is that he became a major proponent of the Benedictine monastic reform that was very vibrant on the continent at the time. And thirdly, he is significant because he is the first Anglo-Saxon king that we know of to have taken a coronation oath. And in that coronation oath, he is specifically referred to as the king of Angleland, or if you slur it together, England. Now, this is a good place to stop and talk for a second about Anglo-Saxon kingship. Anglo-Saxon kingship is rather unique in uh, Europe at the time because it is so effective. Uh, one reason of that, uh, of course, is military power. All kingship in this era is maintained in part on the basis of military power, and that's no different here. Uh, but there are other things that contributed to the growing authority of Anglo-Saxon kings during the period after Alfred the Great. One was that kings increasingly held more and more land in their own right. And since land was a source of wealth, it was also source, a source of power and prestige. Another thing has to do with the king's wergeld. Remember that there was a wergeld for every sort of injury committed against anyone, and the value of the wergeld varied according to the importance of the individual. Well, eventually, the king's wergeld becomes so high that no one can pay it. The king becomes such a valuable member of society that his wergeld is beyond the reach of even the richest man in the kingdom other than the king. And if you can't pay the wergeld with goods or coin, the only other way to pay is with your life. And it is through this that we get the Anglo-Saxon version of the crime of treason. Uh, unlike the, the Roman version of treason, which is, is a crime against the state, here in Britain or in England it is specifically a crime involved with the inability to pay the king's wergeld. So in fact, if you attempt uh, uh, to take the king's life, uh, you pay for that with your own life. Another thing that uh, allowed the kings of Anglo-Saxon England to greatly expand their authority was that they were lawgivers. Uh, they made law codes, they issued new laws known as dooms, and that greatly enhanced their status as well. And finally, there is the matter of the king's peace. The, the idea of the king's peace, to some extent, links to the idea of the wergeld. The, the, the notion of the peace is that each person has about himself or herself his or her own peace that uh, should not be violated. Uh, we, we have kind of an approximation of this in modern parlance, which is that my rights stop where your nose stops. In other words, I have no right to violate your peace by punching you in the nose. Well, to violate the king's peace initially meant only to commit violence against the king's person. But that concept gradually began to grow. As the king's importance increased, it came to apply not only to the king, but also to his family, to his wife the queen, and to his children. As time went on, the king's peace came to apply not only to the king's family, but also to the king's officials who were doing the king's business. It came to apply to certain locations, like the king's castles, and, and the kings always had more than one, so that a crime committed within the precincts of the king's castle violated the king's peace. If the king founded a church or a monastery, a crime committed there might violate the king's peace. If the king sponsored the building of a highway, a crime committed on the highway would be a violation of the king's peace. And since kings claimed the right to many forests in England, a crime committed within the bounds of those forests would also violate the king's peace. In short, you can see where this is going. Ultimately, virtually any 
crime became a violation of the king's peace, and this meant that the king had the right to seek recompense. That is, he had the right to seek justice. Thus the king became the source of all justice, the judge over all crimes. Not literally, but either he or his judges uh, became the judges in all crimes. In the event that someone was found guilty, a payment had to be made into the royal treasury. Uh, in the event that someone sought some sort of service that required a fee, that fee too went into the royal treasury. So the expansion of royal justice increased the king's power in a couple of different ways, by giving him more control over law and order, but also by bringing money into the royal coffers. As time went on, the Anglo-Saxon kings developed a number of different kinds of officials. Uh, there was a, a body of advisors known as the Vitan, who in the early days actually elected the king, uh, still technically did so all the way down to the Norman conquest, although they almost always chose uh, the oldest son of the previous king, unless there was something exceptional uh, at work. But also, uh, at the time, the king tended to keep uh, his money and to conduct much of his business in his own room, in his chamber. Quite literally, uh, the royal treasury was kept in a chest that was kept under the king's bed wherever he was. It's probably not a good idea now, but it made sense then. And thus the person who is in charge of the king's chamber, his chamberlain, came to be the chief financial officer of Anglo-Saxon England for the time being. In addition, the king had to have uh, people working for him who could read and write. Most people couldn't at this time. Indeed, many kings could not, although Alfred was an exception. But you needed people to produce records, uh, to produce government documents, ordering various things to be done, and so on. Well, where do you turn for that? You look to the most literate body of people in the kingdom, that is the clergy. The clergy tended to work in little cubicles called chancels, and the head of the writing office came to be known as the chancellor. The chancellor, uh, over time, because so many of the documents issued by his office were legal documents, came to be the chief legal official in the kingdom. So at the national level, you have the king, his council, the Vitan, his chamberlain, the chief financial officer, and the chancellor, the chief judicial officer. Another significant feature of Anglo-Saxon government was its subdivision into local government. Uh, early on, the Anglo-Saxon kings had given authority to men known as eldermen or earls who ruled over several uh, units known as shires or later called counties. But these proved to be too large and the men who ruled them, the earls, too powerful and thus too dangerous to the king himself. So the kings began appointing an official at the level of each shire called the Shire Reeve or, if you say it really quickly, sheriff. The sheriff came to be the chief uh, law enforcement official. He also was the chief tax collector. And the shires themselves were broken down into smaller units known as hundreds, in which the chief law enforcement official was a constable, uh, with a handful of towns being given special charters that allowed them to govern themselves and which were known as boroughs. Well, to the return to the kings themselves, uh, in the late 10th century, there was a king by the name of Ethelred II, uh, who at the time was known as Ethelred the Reedless, that is, Ethelred who has no council, that is, no advisors, uh, but who has come to be known to history somewhat inaccurately, but appropriately nonetheless, as Ethelred the Unready. Uh, during his reign, the Vikings came back, but they came back in a rather different way. Uh, by about 1000, uh, the Vikings had settled down into three major kingdoms, the Kingdom of Norway, the Kingdom of Denmark, and the Kingdom of Sweden, and they were gradually becoming Christianized. Well, during Ethelred's reign, a Danish king by the name of Svein Forkbeard began invading England. 
And Ethelred began paying him to go away, paying him tribute, which was known as the Dane Geld. In fact, uh, Ethelred developed the system of taxation used by later kings, both Anglo-Saxon and Norman, as a way of collecting this Dane Geld. The trouble with paying tribute is that if you can pay it once, it tempts the receiver to come back and ask for it again. And that's exactly what Svein Forkbeard did until finally Ethelred was unable to pay anymore and Svein Forkbeard invaded and conquered the kingdom in 1013, forcing Ethelred to flee and making himself king of England. Svein died shortly thereafter and a contest ensued between Svein's son, whose name was Canute, and the son of Ethelred, whose name was Edmund, and who is sometimes known as Edmund Ironside. The upshot of this was that the two agreed to split the kingdom until one or the other of them died. But shortly thereafter, Edmund died, and thus Canute became the ruler of England. And in fact, he became a very successful ruler. It's interesting that Canute becomes king in 1016, basically replaces the top level of government with his own followers, and continues to use the existing system, something very similar to what William the Conqueror would do 50 years later. It might very well have turned out, had Canute's successors been luckier, that we would have a Danish-English empire rather than a Norman-English empire later on. Because, in fact, Canute not only ruled England, he also ruled Denmark, and he eventually added uh, Norway to the kingdom as well. His major innovation was to divide England up into four very large earldoms of East Anglia, Mercia, Northumbria, and Wessex, one of which he kept in his own hands. But he was indeed a very effective ruler. Uh, he married the widow of Ethelred, a woman named Emma, uh, proceeded to have more children with her. And when he died, uh, there was a bit of confusion as to who should follow him on the throne. He had a son by his first wife named Harold Harefoot, who was his immediate heir between 1035 and 1040. Uh, his younger son, Harthy Canute, was actually in Denmark at the time and assumed the throne there, but later took the throne of England in 1040. However, both Harold Harefoot and Harthy Canute were short-lived, and in 1042, uh, uh, a descendant or a, a son of Ethelred and Emma uh, by the name of Edward, later known as Edward the Confessor, came back and resumed control of the kingdom of England. Edward owed a good deal of his influence earlier, uh, early on to Godwin the Earl of Wessex, who had come to prominence under Canute, and who sort of treated Edward as a puppet, marrying Edward to his daughter Edith, and allowing his own sons a great deal of authority at the time. Eventually the two feuded, and ultimately Godwin died, uh, leaving Edward uh, more in control than he had been. There are all sorts of stories that, that Edward uh, had really wanted to be a monk and that he was celibate and that that's why he didn't have any children. There's little basis for those. But in fact, Edward did have no children. And when he died in 1066, once again, there was confusion about the succession. There were three major claimants to the throne. One of these was the eldest son of Godwin, Harold Godwinson, who immediately seized control of the throne and was in fact uh, recognized by the Vitan as the rightful king. Uh, a second claimant to the throne was the king of Norway, a, a veteran soldier by the name of Harald Hordrotha, who invaded England in 1066, but was defeated and killed by Harald Godwinson at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in Yorkshire. The third claimant, one who argued that both Edward the Confessor and Harold Godwinson had uh, recognized him as the heir to the throne was William the Duke of Normandy. And as fate would have it, William invaded England 
while Harold Godwinson was in the north fighting Harold Hodrada, and when Harold Godwinson hastened back uh, to the south to fight with William the Conqueror, William was well prepared, and as the nickname indicates, was successful. At the Battle of Hastings in October of 1066, William the Conqueror defeated and killed the last Anglo-Saxon king, Harold Godwinson, and proceeded to establish a Norman monarchy in England, linking Normandy in France to England, uh, importing feudalism into England, and establishing a dynasty that, uh, with some occasional twists and turns, still occupies the English throne today. All right, so now that we've learned about the Anglo-Saxons and the Norman conquest in England, uh, we will again, when we come back for our next lecture, turn our attention to an urban and a commercial revival that takes place during um, the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, cities are being built and, and commerce and trade will increase and grow. And this will, of course, have a lot of uh, uh, consequences um, for Europe as well. And, you know, as we go through and, and, and have our lectures for this um, course, you will also learn about the church and what the church is doing during the High Middle Ages. And uh, eventually we'll get into what's called the Later Middle Ages and the crisis of the 14th century. So when we come back for our next lecture, we'll learn about the urban and commercial revival. Until next time.